right, so without further ado, we will start off with our first speaker, Tyler Burnett, who will be speaking from the Persuasive Speaking Advanced Manual, doing his third speech. This will be five to seven minutes, and the name of the speech is Steve. Thank you. Well, well, new year, new you. New year, new you. You hear that a lot, right? I hear that a lot. It's uh, definitely a benchmark time for all of us to try new things, become the uber versions of ourselves. And so, with my speech, which is a proposal, uh, it's, it's geared more towards a business proposal, which obviously this is not a business, and I am not in the business industry. And if I were to give you a proposal on a scientific project, you probably would just tune out within the first two minutes. <laughs> so, instead, I will be giving you a proposal on maybe a different way of thinking starting this year. So, I'm going to introduce you to my friend. His name is Stefo. Please excuse the masterpiece here. Stefo is actually an acronym, and the acronym stands for Stop, Think, Educate, Form an Opinion, and Open-Mindedness. In today's world, we live in a very polarized political climate. Okay, and let's say this is where we are now, right? The left is not nah, the right. The right, I hate the right. The right's dumb. Bunch of ignorant rednecks. The right's like, well, those liberals don't have any common sense. It's my best Texas accent. You have to excuse me. <laughs> and so that is not a way to get things done. If we really want progress, which I believe connecting to the audience here, is that we all want to move in a somewhat forward direction. And so my goal with Stefo is to bring us more here. We will never be here. Never. As humans currently are now, we will never be completely in the middle agreeing on absolutely everything because that would mean we'd all be exactly the same. And we're not, obviously. And so the first letter is S. It means stop. And this acronym is used when you're discussing with someone else on a political topic. So S stands for stop, and it means stop. Stop your emotions, stop your thinking. Take in what the other person is saying. They may be saying something that is disagreeable to you and really like hits home to you. And you, you have to stop and stop thinking with your emotions. Because when you use your emotions, you're not thinking clearly on how to further solve the issue. And the issue at hand is coming closer together. That's what we want. So the first is stop. You're talking to somebody, just stop, say, hey, you know, this is a human being. I don't know anything about this human being. Let's stop and talk. And, and again, this is not going to work with everybody because some people obviously are just, they are the arms folded, not going anywhere. So you stop, and then you think. Use your brain. It's a, it's a beautiful thing, your brain. It can do a lot of amazing things. I've seen it do a lot of amazing things from a lot of different people. Um, and... By stopping and then thinking about what we're going to say, you can create a plan, per se, on how we're going to move forward. And you're going to say, hey, there's this thing in front of me, there's this obstacle, there's this what have you, disagreement. How are we going to move forward? What's the best option that, that your brain can come up with? Next is educate, E, educate. When I was younger, and my grandfather was on his deathbed, and I feel like he was a wise man, 
I asked him, what is it, what wise, sage advice do you want to give to me going forward? And he told me, one thing, most important thing, is that just because you think you're 10,000% right on a subject does not necessarily make you right. Now, this is my personal belief, and I'm about to back it up with a little bit of evidence and explanation. So, let's take a subject. I am about to graduate with a degree in animal biology and animal science. I think it's fair to say, unless you have a similar degree, that I know a, quite a bit more about animal agriculture, the ins and outs. I'm not saying that you don't have an opinion, or your opinion doesn't matter, but the knowledge on the subject that I do have quite a bit of extensive knowledge. And so even, even with that, I also know that if somebody brings up an issue, say somebody from PETA, which is obviously the agriculture industry and PETA usually butt heads, I like to listen to them. I like to say, what is your issue? What is your issue with us? And what, what can we do to better placate what your issue is? Now sometimes the issue may be, I don't want you to kill any animals, and it's like, well, Sorry, I can't really do that. I have a beef operation to run. But, but I also go forward knowing that just because I have all this information at my disposal does not necessarily make me right. And that I should always look more towards, well, what is this person bringing to the table? Because I believe that everybody has at least something, whether big or small, to bring to the table. Now, after you educate, you form an opinion. So say, it's, say you're educating yourself on a topic that you knew nothing about. You go out and you talk to other people and I usually spend, me personally, you may find your own time, I usually spend between a week and a month really educating myself on a subject and talking to other people about the subject before I form my first initial opinion. And so that's, that's what you want to do because if you sit on the fence you're never going to get anything done. If I sit on the fence and say, well this, and then well that, and never really say, hey, this is kind of what we need to do to move forward, then you don't get anything done. So forming an opinion is important. Now, open-mindedness. Open-mindedness is also important. After you form your opinion, you need to all continually be open-minded to the situation at hand. Always have open-mindedness. Then it goes back to that, just because you think you're 10,000% right doesn't make you right. And so, I believe I'm over time, so I'm just going to uh, finish with the closing statement. With Stefo, my goal is to bring us closer together. And while we may never be here, we can be here and at least move in a direction forward, instead of just looking at each other from across the aisle. And if you think that daily interactions don't matter, well, I, I listened to a quote at a, mo a movie I watched. It was on uh, either women's suffrage or slavery. And it was talking about how like, the little people don't matter. And the person said that, the, the, the other person in the opposition was saying, well, you know, your opinion is just a raindrop. And the other person said, yeah, but... Raindrops make oceans. Thank you. Thank you, Tyler Burnett. Now, please take this time. I'll give you about 30 seconds on your ballot. On your word says, first speaker, please give any feedback. You can list some pros and you can list some cons as well. Um, just give your opinion on how Tyler Burnett could do better and list some constraints. And when you're done with that, you can place it in the little black box at the end of your row.
So I will now introduce our second speaker of the day, which will be Zach Varghese. He will be speaking from the Professional Speaker Advanced Manual Speech Number 4, and his title is Stand Up Straight. For 10 to 5, 15 minutes, please welcome Zach. All right, good evening, Toastmasters and guests. <laughs> so, when I say stand up straight, when I talk about body language on the stage, what tips would you give me? And this is more of an interactive speech than I usually give. So, I'm literally asking you, raise your hands if you can give me one or two tips about how to present yourself on stage. Look people in the eye. Look people in the eye. All right. Who else? Take up space. Take up space. Don't hunch your back. Don't hunch your back. All right, one more. Use hand gestures. Use hand gestures. Would you believe me when I say there are college students today that are presenting in their classrooms that are doing none of these rules? The ones that, you know, you've been taught since maybe elementary school, maybe middle school. I'll be generous and give you high school. They literally was, were the worst presentation I've ever seen, and they were seniors in college. I'll demonstrate. There were five guys. <laughs> Women were better, generally. I'm not saying anything about guys and the girls. Okay, so, first guy was over here, behind the podium, operating the computer, going through slides. He was literally like this. Not like assertive, not anything like that. He had his hands casually on the front and just standing behind. The thing is, when you do that, you kind of look like a dog, like, leaning up, asking for food on the table. Because you're just like, right here, like begging to some, for someone to not pay attention to you and look somewhere else. So, he just stood right here, not looking very assertive, not really seeming like he meant anything of what he said. And the thing is, when you're standing behind a podium, you tend to look weaker than you actually are, because people don't see your powerful stance when you're outside of the podium. You usually look like you're just standing, arms to the side, just weaker, unless you really control your audience. You have to exaggerate all of your movements to really pop out behind the podium. The next guy was even worse. His legs were crossed, and he was rocking back and forth. I don't know how this was comfortable for him, but he did this the entire speech, and I was getting dizzy just watching him. The next guy had this, and his I don't know like how this rocking uh, ever passed any ex exam or any like practice of the entire speech. They practiced this speech multiple times, and this guy is still hands on his head, lightly thrusting at his audience. The next guy was, you know, the shy guy of the entire group, and. Uh, he wasn't looking at you, or over here, or over here. He was looking exactly at this spot of the floor, staring intently like it's going to change somehow. Hands in, exactly like this, in his pockets. And it didn't change when he actually got up to speak. He literally was just staring intently, like he's wanting that spot on the floor to light fire. He's just staring at it. And... They gave an amazing presentation, but it felt like the worst presentation out of the entire lot. And I'm not going to mention names, because, mostly because I don't remember them. But they were so bad. Even though they presented almost the best presentation verbally. Like if you turned off, you put a black screen in front of us, in between the audience and the stage, you would have thought they knew exactly what they were talking about. But the way they presented it, it seemed like they weren't sure 
if they were speaking English or not. I'll demonstrate how you can change this when giving your presentations, or how you pre er, present in general. I'll start like I did in the podium. Make sure your hands aren't just here. Don't, if you put your hands on the podium, or the lectern, you don't keep it right here. This is inactive. You have some sort of in, er, assertiveness. You move your hands a lot, because you're standing in one place. You are motionless, according to them, from the waist down, because they don't see it. You're motionless on top if you're just keeping it right here. Humans are visual beings, men especially, but humans in general. They want to see something exciting, and if you have your hands right here, you don't exactly seem exciting. Now if you have your hands expressing exactly what you're saying, and continue that all throughout your speech, then you seem excited, then you seem like you want to their attention, they give you their attention. Next, out in front, anyone know what a power stance is? Raise your hands if you know. Alright, you're my guinea pig. <laughs> Please stand up and demonstrate what a power stance is. <laughs> Alright. Uh, I was planning on like... Oh. <laughs> Forget it. Alright, so... She did something according to Superman, where literally she was just spread feet, hands on hips, chest out. That means confidence. No matter what culture you're in, if you're in India, in China, in Russia, in the UK, over here, no matter where you are, if you stand like Superman right here, you exude confidence in whatever you're speaking. You don't have to do that, because it almost seems well, comic how you do it, because this kind of is strange to normal humans. You can, though, stand more spread out. You can have your arms up here. You have, can express over here instead of the fig leaf or the behind the back, actually the behind the back is worse than the fig leaf. Or you can do something more than just keep your hands at your side, do something. Have some expression. The next is, you have to make sure you're looking at every single person in the room. And actually, you don't have to look directly at their eyes if you're a shy person. If I look between Anor and Victor, if I look between Bonade, and I forgot your name, I'm sorry, <laughs> Lima. Lima, if I look between Serena, wow, <laughs> <laughs> and if I look right there, I'm not just not looking at names anymore, it'll seem like I'm looking at every single person in this room, even though I'm not really looking at anyone. And it's always better to look a little bit above the audience than right there. When you look down, it means you are shy. It means you're not very confident in what you're saying. It means you don't want to be on the stage. And when you don't want to be on the stage, they think, why are you on the stage? And then they cut you out. They don't listen to you. You need to make sure you're making eye contact. You need to make sure your legs are spread apart. You need to make sure you're emoting with your hands. You need to make sure you're interesting. Those are all the rules for body language on the stage. And there's a famous phrase with rules. Rules can be broken. Rules are made to be broken. And I've seen plenty of people break those rules and still seem interesting. I've seen speakers that literally are sitting on the side of a table and speaking like this. And the way they're emoting with their hands, the way they're interacting with every single person, 
the way that they demonstrate their confidence in what their ability is, that speaks bounds more than the guy that's standing over here and not knowing what they're doing. If you have a speech about something that's tragic in your life, the last thing you want to do is have a smile on your face standing up here with a Superman pose because you sound like a psychopath. You want to really show your audience what you're talking about. You want to be the illustration of the story you're telling. No matter if it's a sad story or a happy story, you need to look it. So, I've given speeches where I'm literally starting out, leaning on the wall, crossing my legs and looking down, and kind of like have my hand up, up on my face, rubbing my neck. And that's where I start, because it's a sad start. I'm not starting like I'm the most joyous person in the world speaking to you, like it's the most exciting moment in my life. I'm speaking like I've just went through a tragedy. And that is a perfect illustration of the point I was trying to make. We need to be illustrations of the points we're trying to bring across through our words and have your body be a, mic or a speakerphone for the words that you're saying. And with those tips, I believe that any single person in this room can become an excellent, not only speaker, but performer on the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Zach. Now please take this time to evaluate that. Spring of 2018, times were a lot simpler. Back in the days when you went to log into ELC, Athena, or UGA email, all you had to do was put your UGA ID and your username, and then put in whatever your password was for that six month iteration. I'm pretty sure most of you would save your username and password into the browser cache anyway. So every time you log into the CAS or Central Authentication Services page, your username and password is already there. You don't have to do is log in. But post spring 2018, UJ has made this process a lot more aggravating in that now there's two-factor authentication. Since all of you are students here at UJ right now, I'm pretty sure you all know what two-factor authentication is. To give you a general idea about what it is, basically, the name kind of says it all. You need two factors of verification to access a piece of information or to access an account, which means not only do you need your password, but you also have to have an RSA token that would be a temporary password to enter, or respond to a notification, push notification from dual mobile. If there's ever a situation where you're thinking there's too much security, this is one of those situations. Because people usually don't think that's like, oh, more security, that's good. No, this is that bad. Because this is something we have to access almost every single day. But why do we have two-factor authentication in the first place? This is something that was not a thing until post-spring 2018. Well, it all started in 2014. 
when a student named Michael Williams became a student here at UGA. He was a salutatorian of his high school, came in with Zell Miller, and also he got other scholarships such as the Coca-Cola First Generation Scholar and a few others. While at UGA, he also got some certifications from Lean Six Sigma Yellow Belt to Salesforce Administrative Certificate. All these things from grades, certificates, everything, internships at big firms like IBM and Coca-Cola. This was the ideal student that Taylor College of Business wanted in their program because he was an MIS major. And this is a student that the University of Georgia wanted to graduate from the, from the university. Everything was looking good. It looked like if this student were to just keep going and just keep doing what he was doing, he would get the ideal job. Technology consulting, any kind of consulting, project management, anything. But in March 2016, he joined the EITS team. EITS, which is Enterprise Information Technology Services, or the UGA IT team, Anyone who has Wi-Fi problems, network problems, or just can't log into their account because they forgot their password, these are the people you email or call on the phone to make sure that they can help you out. And because of that, you need heightened privileges on your UJ ID account, which means you're able to access anyone's account remotely and able to help them. Because of that, Michael was able to access anyone who had a UJ ID account here at UJ. Not only do students have a UJ ID, but also faculty have UJ IDs. And that includes their professors. And once you get their UJ ID, you can log into anything from their ELC, their Athena, even their UJ email. Most people at EITS, they are entrusted to make sure they don't, you know, abuse their powers and log into all these things. And it hasn't happened since then. Or someone has done it and just not been caught. But this is a man, Michael Williams, who just <laughs> found this power and decided, you know what? I can actually log into my professor's account and change my grades. So he did that during his first semester at EITS. At the very end of the semester, he logged into his professor's account, changed his grade from a B- to an A in any class, such as MSIT 3000, any class. And he got away with it. And he thought, you know what? It worked pretty well. I'll just do it again. So then the next semester in the fall, 2017, did it again. Logged in, changed his grades, but not only his grades, but other people's grades too. So if anyone noticed that the grades are changed, they wouldn't be able to figure out who did it. And it was also very clever because you can't change your grades just any time during the semester because they have to correlate on ELC and Athena. If at the end of the semester they don't correlate, then the professor will get an error message and then you'll have to go in, he or she will have to go in and fix it. So it was only a very small window that Michael found out that you can change these grades where they will be synchronized across both platforms. And that was on the day at the very end of the semester when grades are due. That time, from midnight to 2 a.m., he would go in every single semester at the very end and change the grades on Athena and ELC. And they'd match up, and then he would change it for other people as well. It worked every single semester from 2014 all the way until his last semester of 2018, when he changed his grade in his cyber threat intelligence course. That's when everything went wrong. <laughs> he changed his grade for a professor who was a professor in cybersecurity. <laughs> now you're thinking, if this is his first time, clearly you wouldn't do it, but it's worked every single time so far, so why would it fail now, and especially in his last semester? But the professor, Dr. Lee, I'm currently taking right now, he told us that one day after grades were due, he tried to log back into ELC afterwards. And then all of a sudden he couldn't log back in. He contacted EITS and he asked, why can't you log back in? He didn't authorize password change or anything. And then EITS said they didn't either. But only a few people have high enough privileges to access and change these accounts, like so. And they traced it back to Michael. So in his final semester, he was convicted of 80 felonies because every single time you log into another person's account, that's considered a financial issue because if, say, you change your grades to keep a scholarship like Zelle or another scholarship, that can cost the state thousands of dollars or another company thousands of dollars. So that's why it was so significant. And also they wanted to make an example out of him, in my opinion, because after hearing that, no one else would want to do it again. 
I talked to a few other professors who had to also be interviewed for, for being professors of Michael. And they all said kind of the same thing. He was a good kid. He was very hardworking, very studious. It kind of surprised me that someone like this would do that. And I looked at his link, LinkedIn, it was really depressing because it said all these things such as aspiring technology consultant and cybersecurity. It was all lined up for him. But he cheated his way through and then now he faces the consequences. And now we all face the consequences. <laughs> <laughs> And you're probably thinking, why at UGA would something like this happen? It doesn't happen to anyone else. But in fact, it happens to big firms, big institutions. Even, for example, one of the biggest ones that happened somewhat recently was Target. In 2013, they were hacked by some individuals from Russia, and they stole thousands of credit card and debit card numbers, including their security codes. And it cost them billions and millions of dollars, and also hurt their reputation. For UGA, this was not someone from Russia or China, some sophisticated hacker group. This was an insider student, just someone like you and me. This is someone that could have been here at the club, but he's not. <laughs> and this is someone who's supposed to graduate a year ago, but he didn't because he failed. So if you're going to take away anything from the story, is that you shouldn't cheat. And if you do cheat, don't get caught. Because if you do, we will have three-factor authentication. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.